I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the um, final uh, session. So what you've seen this morning really is the, the what of effectiveness. You, you've seen what news brands deliver in terms of business effectiveness. Uh, and we've shown brand new evidence for the effect, particularly of digital news brands and how they should be considered separately from that amorphous mass uh, of digital. Uh, so to finish off the event this morning, we want to take a little bit of time to explore the why. Um, so I hope you're sitting comfortably because this next presentation is quite meaningful and there's quite a lot of stuff in it. Um, we wanted to really to understand what, why news brands are effective um, and how do they fit into today's complex media landscape. So to do that, we're going to take you back 50 years um, to 1967. Now, there were two really important things that happened that year. Um, one is, and I know you won't believe this, but I was born. And in just a few weeks, I shall be 50. I can't quite believe it. Um, but also, a book called The Medium is a Massage was published by a rather, rather clever chap called Marshall McLuhan. And, and no, it's not a Freudian slip. Uh, it was actually started talking about the concept of the medium as a message about three years earlier in 1964. But then when he published his book um, in 1967, the apparently the story is that the typesetter got it wrong uh, and says the medium is the massage. But actually McLuhan quite liked it because this sort of concept of the medium massages the message within it is really important and I, you know, I don't really think that anybody would disagree with that. But we wanted to understand how relevant is that today and you know, actually the definition of a medium is a really challenging thing to get your head around these days. What is a medium? What's a platform? You know, how do you disentangle it all? So we commissioned uh, Flamingo and Tapestry to explore McLuhan's ideas in the context of the modern media landscape. Uh, we used a variety of different methodologies, but more detail on that on the website. Um, we used semiotics, we used qual and we used quant uh, to unpick and, and, and sort of really understand the learnings in the modern media landscape. So Kate Knight from Flamingo and Kevin Thompson from Tapestry are going to take you through a summary of the findings. There's actually a lot more behind this, and we're only be able to, going to be able to skim the surface uh, today. Uh, but there's going to be, obviously, decks available on the website. And actually, we've recorded our first ever series of podcasts, uh, which should be uploaded uh, by the end, time of the end of the presentation. So if you want to listen to sort of 10 or 12 minute, four 10 or 12 minute episodes giving you more detail, those will be available uh, to download from SoundCloud and, and via the Newsworks website. So I'm going to hand over to Kate and Kevin to take you through the meat of the presentation. Hi there, thanks Denise, and um, thanks for uh, a challenging project. It's a bit of a theme today that Newsworks likes to set its agencies challenging projects, and this certainly was one. Um, but really interesting at the same time. Um, I'm going to talk, um, hopefully quite uh, briefly um, and concisely about Marshall McLuhan's ideas. Um, before I start, I just wondered how many people here have read his book? understanding media, a, a handful. I, th I was hoping there might be all of you and then I could step down and hand over to Kevin. Um, okay, well, for those of you who haven't, um, I've, I have read it. Uh, I, I skim read the chapter on the Telegram. I might go back to that later. But um, essentially, um, I'm going to give you three ideas from this book. It's full of ideas. When he wrote it, his publisher said, you know, normally when I get a book, um, but when, normally when people publish new books, there's about 15% of the content that's new. In your book, 85% is new. And I think that's possibly why a lot of what we're talking about today, a lot of his thinking is still feels really, really relevant. Um, but the three key points I'm going to talk about are uh, the medium is the message. So this is a, probably an aphorism that a lot of you have heard before. And that's the idea that mediums influence how the message is understood. So you might have the same content in the form of a telegram, a song, and a tweet. Um, but actually, the form of that medium will influence how you kind of experience that content. Uh, the second idea is that mediums reconfigure our human environment. Uh, and that's to say that the mediums we use to communicate have a social effect. So they actually shape our culture, our behaviors, and our values. And the third idea is that when you introduce a new medium, and I think we can all agree that there are lots of new mediums today, um, it doesn't kill the old ones, but it does reconfigure the relationship between old mediums and new mediums. Uh, and this, uh, this is quite an important idea. In fact, mediums all affect one another, and they all involve in relation with one another. 
So, sorry. So the first idea of McLuhan's, um, the medium as a message, he, he, his classic example that he, he talks about to, bring, to illustrate this point is the Nixon and Kennedy debate. So he said, if you watched this debate on TV, you would have an impression that uh, Kennedy was really the, the, the winner of this debate, that he was the much more convincing politician. And actually, Nixon would sort of seem like a bit of a phony. Um, if, on the other hand, you heard this debate on the radio, you would actually have had an overwhelming sense of Nixon's superiority. You'd have a completely different perception of how that debate had panned out. And he says that this is because radio takes cartoon characters seriously. He sort of describes Nixon as being too sharp for TV um, and then being not enough subtlety to him. And I think today, if there is one kind of benefit to us researchers of a Trump kind of presidency, it's that uh, this example is still very top of mind when people talk about it. So uh, a, a lady that reads the Daily Mail uh, was telling me at length that she kind of had quite a positive to neutral impression of Trump uh, for a little while, but then she started seeing videos of him uh, pop up on the Daily Mail website. And as she watched these, she sort of realized quite how crazy this man was. Um, the second idea then of McLuhan's is that new mediums reconfigure our human environment. Um, that's to say that new mediums have a social effect. They, they have an impact on a culture's values and behaviors. Um, and he, like one of the easiest ways to think about the sort of shift in, in values that comes about with new mediums is to think about society before we were illiterate and then to think about society after we were illiterate. So he talks about pre-alphabet society and he talks about how in this society the dominant organ for sort of receiving communication was the ear. And so in that sense, hearing was believing. Um, but you don't only hear the word, you sort of feel it too. You hear the tone, you hear the emotion, the affect, the stress, the stress. And so the communication was quite sensuous, you would say. Um, at the same time, the fact of kind of communicating verbally meant that um, communication was more, much more instantaneous. Um, he described it as an all at once society. And the impact of that is that it's highly participatory and inclusive. If, now, if you contrast that with, with a society based on the values of the written word, so McLuhan said the written word, when we kind of invented the alphabet, this reshaped human experience drastically. Suddenly, we had the ability to kind of rec record our thoughts, feelings, observations, experience. We had the ability to detach from the world we lived in and to detach from the moment. We had the tools to classify and slice up the world and human experience. So the social effect of this shift was that we moved from a society in which uh, everything was all at once. It was very inclusive, participatory, sensuous, sort of made dominant modes of communication. And we moved to a society that was based, that was much more individualistic, much more private, um, where everything was one thing at a time. It was lineal, connected, logical, and goal-oriented. And, and the reason I've got uh, the Stars and Stripes flag up here is because McLuhan really wanted us to uh, try and imagine what it would feel like um, to move from one society to another. Because when you're in it, you don't necessarily really realize the rupture that's happening. Um, so he said, if you imagine the stars and stripes, and then you imagine uh, a piece of white cloth with the words American flag written on it, essentially these two objects have the same meaning. But being sort of, this, taking this sort of rich visual mosaic of the stars and stripes and translating that into this written form, deprives it of most of its qualities, its corporate image and experience. So even though the abstract bond is the same, you don't feel the same way when you look at the stars and stripes as you do when you look at this white cloth. And, and McLuhan says that as we become literate, nearly all the emotional and corporate family feeling is eliminated from our relationship with our social group. And it's really interesting if we could try and imagine what's going on today. Um, the final idea that I'm going to talk through really briefly is this idea that when you introduce new mediums uh, like print or like TV or radio or Instagram, um, that sort of changes the dynamic, it changes the landscape um, and it changes the values on that landscape. Um, and that means that 
new mediums kind of reconfigure the relationship between old mediums, between legacy and established mediums. So they all kind of affect each other and they evolve in relationship with one another. Um, so McLuhan was writing in 67 at a time when TV and radio, the, what he called electric mediums, were starting to disrupt print. Um, and when he talks about the impact of TV on society, it's related to the structures that print had established. So these lineal, um, kind of one thing at a time, things were much slower, more fragmented. And he said that, that TV and radio were re retribalizing society. Um, he said that TV encouraged a, a return to collective participation of tribal days through its ritualistic and rhythmic programming. So audiences come together all at once and enjoy big emotions. And that, in that way, TV is, is retribalizing. And he, he's got a really lovely example, actually, of literally how TV was retribalizing re society. So this is a picture from the film Sparrows Can't Sing, and it was subtitled. Um, it's in English, but it was subtitled because there were dialects in it. Um, and that's because TV being a more inclusive medium, it started to celebrate regional dialects. And the impact on this was actually an upsurge in the UK of regional dialects. So in this new configuration, the written word didn't disappear. What happened, in fact, was that we started to live in a world that was based around both sets of values. So we started to live in a world which was based around thinking values which fragment, as well as feeling values which unify. So what does that look at like? Um, looking at mediums today, we see two key dimensions at play. And I think there's sometimes a, a sort of false notion that the media world is divided into old and new, but this feels quite simplistic. It's, it's actually much more interesting to look at uh, the media landscape and what are the kind of key values that underpin that and then where do different mediums, where do more established mediums sit versus um, newer mediums, and Kevin's going to plot all of those later. Um, uh, so in our research, we found that there are these two key dimensions at play. So on the one hand, um, there's the, the think versus feel. So there's the, the extent to which a medium prompts us to feel the story versus thinking about it. So the extent to which mediums engage the senses versus our rational mind, the extent to which mediums uh, communicate emotion versus fact. And then on the other sort of spectrum is this convergence versus divergence. So the extent to which a story is being honed down into a single aligned perspective versus the extent to which it's being opened up and expanded on into diverse perspectives. And McLuhan's prediction was that with the rise of TV and radio, what we would see is a return to this kind of more tribal society that's more inclusive, more participatory, this all at once society um, uh, and at, at his most optimistic, he kind of imagined media as a kind of benign source of new togetherness, sort of a place where psychic communal integration might occur. Um, I think uh, in the days of Trump, we probably hope that that isn't the case. Um, but actually, the internet's reconfiguring media in two key ways. Uh, so it is true that we're seeing and a kind of spread out, a shift to feeling a new story rather than simply thinking it through. Uh, there are simply more ways to, to engage with a new story now. And these means and these mediums use a wider range of our senses than simply vision. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing a greater, um, a, 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 an increased kind of divergence. Um, at the same time, the speed with which information is produced and shared has led to an increase in the sheer volume of perspectives. So there's simply more divergence out there than ever before. So whilst we are being pulled up to the right, the, the sort of, uh, the, the graph is also, uh, divergence is also pulling down. So when we're sort of feeling stories a lot more, but we're also bombarded with a lot more perspectives on things. What does this feel like? So, when we talk to people about what this means for how they consume news, they sort of talk about, uh, they talk about being much more critical of content. So we're in a world where we're presented with infinite and constantly updating information and news, people say they're much more selective. They, they say that they have a more on-demand mentality when it comes to uh, what they choose to read and the brands they choose to engage with. Um, 
we believe that we're more critical and selective, essentially. Um, but ironically, what we see is actually that despite there being more opportunities to find and engage with different perspectives, this isn't always what happens. And actually what we see is, is often more convergent news consumption. Um, I think what happens is when, when, you're, when you're faced with a greater number of opinions, we more often than not pick the one that fits with our worldview. So like I might try and go on Breitbart and read stuff on there once a week, but I don't really want to. Um, I'd far sooner spend time elsewhere. So when we're thinking, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a lovely example from the research actually, where um, one of the respondents was telling us at length about how she really didn't like a particular news brand, uh, spent about 20 minutes slating it. And then later on, I asked her to tell me about a story she'd shared recently and to show me a, a story that she'd commented on. And she, she showed me one, and she was surprised that it came from this brand that she'd been slating. But uh, essentially, it, it, the story itself had really chimed with her worldview and what she thought about um, and what she thought about the world. So it, it feels like when we're in this mindset of filtering news on social media, we tend to assume that the news we come across um, that we agree with comes from a brand we trust. Um, and it's only when we disagree with a story that pops up that we might actually be critical. Um, so whilst there is a great divergence provided by mediums today, it doesn't necessarily lead to people encountering more divergent points of view. Um, I'm going to hand over to Kevin now, who's going to explain where every, everyone sits on this map. Cool. Thanks, Kate. Um, so against this backdrop, as Kate says, the, um, the world of mediums have changed somewhat. In fact, one of the problems we faced when we started doing this was what is a medium anyway? Um, Digital has completely changed that. What were single platform mediums have now evolved into what we've been referring to and trying to think of as being hybrid mediums. And as Peter alluded to at the very start of this, even new mediums like social media have now evolved to offer video. So what the hell is a medium? Um, essentially, uh, we've seen all these, these sort of new forms of media evolve. And the most sort of powerful uh, organizations that have adapted to this are news brands. They've led the way by taking their sort of heritage strengths, and we'll look at what their heritage strengths are in a second. And they've expanded it by adding new types of news delivery. Uh, so now you see, you see print, it's up there in the top left, um, but you also see news brands offering professional videos. You see news brands offering real life videos, kind of unmediated, unedited, undirected, if undirected is a word, uh, videos on their sites. And you can see all these different changes take place. Um, and print certainly hasn't died a death. Um, again, Peter alludes to it. Um, everyone's really talked about how powerful print is, and, and they really sort of reconfigure their role around this thoughtful, um, thoughtful place they have in people's news habits. And they give that sense of completeness. In fact, as one of the respondents that Kate spoke to said, um, you can't read the internet from cover to cover. Um, so print really gives you a sense of this is what matters here and now. So to focus on print, um, it's that sort of privileging of the written word that forces us to think and really take stock of what's uh, there, what's included, and give us that context and content to build understanding of a story. Uh, if you think about how print's laid out and how newspapers are laid out, um, all the stories are relative to each other. Its pages are all carefully correlated and collated. It's kind of a hierarchy of what is seen to be important that day. And it gives that lens from which readers can view the world. Um, and it gives, I say, it gives the sense of completeness. It's kind of single form. It's touch and it's vision. It doesn't get sort of split up and splintered into different types of sense uh, in the same way that maybe digital does. In terms of numbers, and I'm the numbers person, Kate does feelings, I do numbers, um, the, uh, what print really offers you is this kind of over-indexing of giving you depth, giving you detail, give, arming you with the facts. And that's all kind of thoughtful and excellent. But it also, to a degree, it does confirm what you think. It does tell you what people like you are talking about. You choose a news brand that reflects your view on the world. Um, so it puts it up in the, the sort of thoughtful but slightly convergent space. I mentioned the news brands have done a great job of extending and using hybrid mediums to change the way that 
news is consumed uh, through their various outlets. And one thing that you certainly see a rise in is uh, professional videos on news brand websites. So we're moving into the digital world here. Um, and the sort of craft of a filmmaker allows news brands to immerse you emotionally in a story, um, gives you a narrative which challenges thinking and can introduce you to new ideas. Um, but clearly it also helps you relate to stories and gives you a sense of being there. Um, so it's kind of, it's a bit divergent. It, it sort of helps challenge and give you a different point of view, but it also brings you closer to feeling a story. So it's quite a change from the legacy print um, delivery. On the other hand, um, if the editor goes away, if the director goes away, and you just have unfiltered, unmediated, real-life videos on websites, on news brand websites, then it brings you even closer to the story. You haven't got someone directing or telling you what to think. You've got the person, the real people involved in the story, giving you directly what matters. And that gives an even greater emotional punch. So we've kind of seen that just through using new forms of delivery, news brands have gone from a very sort of thoughtful, place up on the top left of the map, through into more of a feeling and divergent space, then right into the, the full emotional connection. As a point of comparison, you can think of TV bulletins. Um, I'm going to use the example of the wedding of Charles and Diana here. Um, to be completely honest, I did not watch the wedding of Charles and Diana. I wasn't waving a little union flag, but lots and lots of people in the country were, and it really brought everyone together. Um, and that's what the TV news bulletin used to be. It used to be a, a thing that told everyone what was going on and brought them all together and experienced an event. But now the news bulletins kind of struggle. Um, they're up against new forms that give new live versions. Um, one of the respondents um, that we spoke to in the study kind of said that news, news bulletins were extending the liveness, almost milking the liveness of event. If you actually want to know what's happen, happening, you go to Twitter or another digital platform, potentially a news brand, and it tells you what's happening as the story's unfolding. Then the news, brand, the news bulletin comes along, and it's got a person stood beside something where something happened a little while ago and it's finished, but they're talking as if it's still live and happening. So the news bulletins have changed. Um, it still gives you depth, it gives you detail, um, and that's great. Um, it introduces you to a few kind of new ideas, and it introduces you to a slightly broader perspective on the world, but it doesn't give you any feeling, it doesn't give you any connection to the story. And as we saw, news brands do that, and they do that often through the use of video on their digital platforms. Um, but also there's another place that we get feelings these days. Lots of people get their feelings on social media. Um, uh, so we, we looked at what news was like being delivered through social media platforms. Um, and we've looked at it both just news in general, and then we've looked at it when news brands partner with social media. Um, so you know, news stories being delivered through Facebook or Twitter, um, but with the news brand badge and potentially links to the news brand website. If you just focus on what happens when news comes through Facebook or Twitter without uh, the addition of a news brand, um, then they're kind of very feeling, very convergent. So if you think about it, on Facebook, you're building your own story, really. It's not a news delivery platform. It's more about curating your own story through relationships, through the things you like. Um, and by extension, it makes news much more personal. It's sort of experienced a series of talking points, really, kind of sort of the public's conversation, but really it's your public's conversation. It's what the people you know are talking about. Um, it, it really is dominated by imagery and less connected to depth and feeling and facts. Um, to go back to McLuhan, um, what McLuhan sort of likened it, like it image to, a photo is a, is a sentence without any syntax. It's an image, it sort of gives you a feeling, but it doesn't really give you any depth or meaning behind it. And as we move all of this, if, if we sort of think about how news is changing and how news is moving from a thoughtful place into a feeling place, um, we have to think about what it means for trust, trust in the delivery of news. And, you know, mediums are moving this way. They're moving into this thoughtful, uh, into this space where it's about feeling a story, and it's about converging on at least the people you know's point of view. Um, and it's really noticeable that trust in the news that's being delivered through these mediums is, is, is at its lowest as we move up to that space. So only 37% of what people were reading uh, or seeing or consuming in terms of news 
uh, was trusted when they saw it as being in that top left-hand space, or when we modelled it to be in that top left-hand space. On the other hand, the highest place is, you can be is down here. So the most trustworthy news delivery mechanisms are those which uh, give, make you think, give you the facts, give you depth and understanding, and also introduce you to different points of view. So if you think about it, um, trust is down here, um, and it's less trustworthy the more it's about making you feel something or making you uh, sort of think that it's, you're feeling what everyone else is feeling. And you can see that in action if you start looking back at social media again. Not to pick on social media, but certainly um, it's one of the places where it's just easiest to compare uh, news delivered with news brands and without. So if you remember, um, Facebook and Twitter, news delivered through those two platforms, we saw as being very much about feeling a story and about um, what everyone else is feeling. On the other hand, if you have a news brand uh, delivering news through social media, then the sort of effect, that legacy, slightly more thoughtful role that news provide, that news brands provide, starts dragging um, the news that you get through social media more towards that thoughtful space, more towards that slightly divergent, slightly different point of view space. And as a result, it's much more trusted. So the news that is delivered with news brands through social media is 1.4 times or 40% uh, more trusted than news delivered uh, through just other sources, through social media. Um, so the way that you deliver news has a big impact on how trustworthy it is, and news brands can have a big impact on how trustworthy uh, the delivery is seen. <coughs> so just to sum all that up, different media can be thoughtful, different media can help you feel and, and uh, relate to a story emotionally. Um, some media sort of hone down the story into a single point of view that uh, converges on, on one place, and some open it up to much more diverse views. New, medias, uh, new mediums have reconfigured that, uh, the landscape. Um, digital hybrid mediums have kind of expanded it entirely, and they've moved things much more away from being thoughtful and divergent into something more feeling-driven. Um, but news brands have adapted to that, and they've have adapted to that better than other medium and other uh, delivery channels. Um, they use the new forms to deliver feeling and deliver different points of view, while keeping that sort of legacy trustworthy power that they've always been associated with. And it's very important to note that uh, trust is very correlated with the thoughtful, divergent point of view um, that the legacy news brands live in which means that they've achieved an optimum balance, really, keeping a high level of trust, but, but also using digital to dial up feeling and uh, expand their footprint. And that is us. <laughs>